This hearing of the Military Construction, Veterans Affairs, and Related Agencies Subcommittee will come to order. Thank you all for participating in this hearing on the Department of Veterans Affairs response to COVID-19. As this hearing is fully virtual, we must again address a few housekeeping measures. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you'd like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock will still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock, I would just say somewhere on the screen, depending on what, what type of device you're using, that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. However, as always, we do allow for a little flexibility in order to make sure questions are answered and that the member can finish their sentence. But try to include the witness's answer in the time that you have allotted when you are uh, asking a question. In terms of the speaking order, we'll follow the order set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and the ranking member. Then members present at the time of, that the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order after that. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing in any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. So we, so we begin. Today, we welcome Dr. Richard Stone uh, back to the committee, Acting Undersecretary for Health at the Department of Veterans Affairs, accompanied by Dr. Cameron Matthews, Assistant Undersecretary for Health for Clinical Services. It has been almost one year since the Department of Veterans Affairs had its first case of COVID-19. And in that time, much has changed at VA, across the country, and around the world. Tragically, VA has seen over 10,000 deaths, including 130 employees. This heartbreaking number highlights how important this work is as we continue our oversight of the funding and the policies that are needed to keep our veterans and our workers safe. As the largest integrated healthcare system in the United States, VA has an enormous responsibility to our veterans and their families, our healthcare providers and other employees, and to the nation as a whole through VA's fourth mission to assist with public health needs. When we last held a hearing on VA's COVID response in May, there were some areas of deep concern and some areas that had been improving. I and other members were very troubled by what was happening at the time with regards to the provision of personal protective equipment or PPE, the standard of COVID treatments provided to our veterans and the need to make testing available to all. While some of the problems were due to the overall mismanagement of the pandemic by the Trump White House, there were problems in VA's management of the pandemic as well. Poor communication, inconsistent guidance and unclear strategies were frequent topics that we discussed and we have continued to discuss with VA leadership over the past year. I'm looking forward to hearing how these areas have, have progressed and what lessons have been learned since then. It has been promising to see the data on active cases and hospitalizations pointing in the right direction in recent weeks, but I don't want us to lose sight of the work that still has to be done. Where are there still challenges? Where can we do better? Because our veterans deserve not just better, they deserve the best. Certainly there are some things that are fundamentally different from where we were last spring, such as the fact that we now have vaccines, which bring great hope and also great operational challenges. VA has recently hit a milestone of having vaccinated over 1 million individuals, and that number continues to climb. Getting people vaccinated is critical to stopping the spread of this disease, and it is heartening to see that so many veterans have turned to VA as a trusted healthcare resource. Undertaking such a significant public health effort requires a lot of coordination between VA leadership individual VA facilities and other federal partners like the CDC, as well as the doctors, nurses, administrative staff, and others at the VA who are out there every day helping our veterans. I wanna make sure that we are giving VA all the tools we can to vaccinate the widest universe of veterans and that no one is getting unfairly left behind. Our subcommittee has fought to make sure that VA has the resources it needs throughout this pandemic by providing almost $20 billion in emergency funding in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and the CARES Act. The bulk of that money was for patient care and other healthcare needs in order to enable VA to provide the best and safest healthcare possible during a pandemic, 
such as by expanding its telehealth capacity. And this funding allowed VA to increase its efforts to help groups of veterans uniquely impacted by the pandemic, like homeless veterans. This subcommittee has kept a close eye on the execution of that funding and what additional resources will be required to sustain needed staffing and service level expansions. It is also clear that the pandemic has had a ripple effect on healthcare at VA as veterans delayed non-urgent care or more veterans turned to the VA for their care and that will bring further costs for us down the road. Clearly, there is more to do to make sure the VA is able to protect the health and economic security of all veterans, which is why I'm pleased that President Biden has put forward an American rescue plan that recognizes the needs of our veterans and those who care for them. The truth is that this pandemic is not over, particularly as we learn about new and potentially more contagious variants of the disease, we must remain vigilant. In fact, just this moment, a headline came across my, uh, my, my iPad saying that we've just detected the first uh, Brazil variant in the state of Florida. So we really have our work cut out for us. That means that while it's good news that active cases and hospitalizations are, dro are dropping and that more and more Americans are getting the vaccine, there remains the possibility for another wave of cases. Preparedness is critical. Having PPE, testing supplies and staff is just as important today as it was at the beginning of the pandemic. So today's hearing is gonna give us valuable insight on where things stand. Our ranking member, Judge Carter, is unfortunately unable to join us today because of continued power outages as, as a result of the winter storm and impacting Texas. Standing in as ranking member today is my dear friend, Congressman John Rutherford from the state of Florida. And Mr. Rutherford, thank you so much uh, for stepping into this role today. You are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, it's all, always great to see you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, and 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 thank you uh, for yielding, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, the, you know, my thoughts are also with Judge Carter as they they fight with that, uh, along with all the Texans down there. They're fighting with a a crazy uh, polar vortex, apparently. But uh, but you know, I, I want to mention that uh, late last May this subcommittee held a hearing on VA's response to COVID-19. And, and I think we were one of the first appropriation subcommittees to hold a hybrid meeting. And uh, so some of us attended in person, as you remember, and then some of us, uh, and this was all new at the time. And some of us uh, participated remotely. And and uh, I, I have to say, Madam Chairwoman, I, I'm, I remain impressed. We were the first, okay? And uh, so thank you uh, for, for making that happen. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I wanna thank you again for your leadership and encouragement to adapt and utilize this technology uh, to conduct oversight for the care and concern of our constituents. Uh, the, the hearing that we had in May seems a whole lot longer than just eight months ago. Uh, but, but at that time, CARES funding was, you know, everything was new, it was just rolling out. Yet today we're looking at how it's been spent along with the money included in the, in the end of year package and considering what more may need to be done to defeat this virus as it continues to mutate as, as, as you just mentioned. Uh, we cannot take our eye off the ball just because these numbers are now beginning to go down. Uh, so I'm, I'm very concerned about that. But I do think overall looking at, uh, at the job that VA has done uh, I, I think they've they've done a pretty good job. There are those areas of concern that the that the chairwoman uh, mentioned earlier, and and I look forward to hearing from Dr. Stone and Dr. Matthews about their response to those issues. And I, I have a couple issues that I'll bring up later, but uh, but but I do want to say, you know, to the doctors, nurses, the frontline healthcare staff, and that includes you know the IT people and all of that. Uh, they truly deserve our gratitude. Uh, I mean, you mentioned, Madam Chair, you know, 130 uh, of our VA personnel lost their lives. And, and some of them were infotech people and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and so, uh, Dr. Stone and Dr. Matthews, if you would, please take back to the organization, uh, you know, our, our gratefulness and our condolences. Uh, for for that loss because uh, that is huge and and so I look forward to to hearing from Dr. Stone and Dr. Matthews and and with that Madam Chair I'll, I'll yield back.
You're, you're muted, Madam Chair. I pressed the button and it didn't unmute. I, I was just singing your praises, so I will repeat myself and say that it is always a joy to work with you and, uh, and especially uh, to make sure that we can take care of our nation's veterans. And so thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, my colleagues, we've been joined by the chair of the full committee, Congresswoman Laura, Rosa DeLauro. Madam Chair, you are recognized uh, for your opening remarks. And you need to unmute. <laughs> there we go. How's that? Perfect. Yeah, this is that's going to be in, emblazoned on our foreheads and everywhere else. <laughs> so let me just recognize Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Ranking Member John Carter, and uh, Mr. Rutherford, um, uh, with uh, you being here this morning. Um, and uh, thank you for arranging today's hearing. Dr. Stone, Dr. Matthews, uh, we are appreciative of your testimony today uh, to discuss the VA's response to COVID-19. Uh, throughout this pandemic, Americans from every walk of life have been forced to contend with unanticipated and sometimes drastic changes to their lives and their livelihoods. Not least among them are our nation's veterans. Uh, though adapting to this pandemic has been difficult for all of us, it has been especially difficult for those veterans who rely on the Department of Veterans Affairs for their health care needs. For the past year, the VA has faced a number of unprecedented challenges from helping to provide their staff and veterans, um, that the veterans that they care for with proper personal protective equipment to administering the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, unfortunately, the previous administration's mismanagement of supply chains, and in my view, general disregard for science led to serious missteps early on. Thankfully, the VA has amended some of its policies to better ensure that both VA employees are getting the equipment they require and our veterans are getting the care they need. My own state of Connecticut, the VA response has generally, generally been very strong. The VA Connecticut healthcare system serves approximately 190,000 veterans in our state and ranks among the best VA facilities in the nation for providing COVID-19 vaccines at VA facilities. I recently met with veterans at the West Haven VA vaccination clinic in my district. As a matter of fact, just about our entire Connecticut delegation went to the West Haven VA and um, it was extraordinary. Uh, they were able to get veterans in and out within 20 minutes. They had a line uh, for first doses, a line for second doses, uh, and they told us that they could vaccinate up to a thousand uh, veterans a day if they had the supply. Um, uh, uh, and uh, they are grateful, uh, you know, what the veterans told me that they are grateful for the local VA's organized and smooth response. But I'm keenly aware that many VA patients across the country have not been so fortunate. So it's vital that we continue to provide robust oversight of the VA healthcare system, make sure that all of our nation's veterans are getting safe, high quality care. Um, we all know this, but our service members have sacrificed. It, it always bears repeating uh, so much for all of us. It's our duty to ensure that they are properly cared for. Um, uh, and as appropriators, we need to provide the resources and the equipment that veterans and the VA staff need. And what we also need to do though, is to continue to push for greater transparency and oversight so that the VA lives up to our nation's commitments uh, to our veterans. And with that, um, Madam Chair, uh, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we appreciate your support of our nation's veterans and for helping us be able to make sure we can take good care of them. Um, I, I don't believe we have been joined by, uh, by Ranking Member Granger. Um, so with that, Dr. Stone, your full written testimony will be included in the record and you are recognized for five minutes to summarize your remarks. Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Congressman Rutherford, members of the subcommittee. Uh, Dr. Matthews and I are very pleased to be here today to discuss VA's response to COVID-19 with you. This pandemic has caused terrible human loss to veterans as well as to the VA employees across the organization. And every day we mourn those losses that we have sustained. And unfortunately, I need to inform you that uh, our 131st employee passed this morning in the state of Ohio. Despite the risk, 
VHA employees have continued to show up every single day and perform heroic work on behalf of America's veterans, as well as the entirety of the American population. VA's response to this pandemic has demonstrated the strength and agility of our highly integrated nationwide healthcare system. VA is deeply indebted to Congress for providing the funding under the CARES Act that has allowed this resource to be available not only to veterans, but also to be a backstop to the American healthcare system. Because of CARES Act funding, we've been able to hire nearly 80,000 staff across the country to sustain and expand our capacity to take care of veterans and non-veterans alike. We are now approaching the last mile of this pandemic. And because of the hard work of researchers who developed the vaccine with the substantial contributions from the VA research community, as well as the specialists in logistics and pharmacy that are getting the vaccines distributed and prepared as quickly as possible to our nearly 300 vaccination sites, VA has administered over 1.3 million doses of vaccine to veterans thus far. And over 1 million veterans have received their first dose. We've also vaccinated more than 275,000 VA employees, most of whom are frontline healthcare workers. Finally, we've vaccinated nearly 10,000 essential public facing employees of other federal agencies. With the current limited supply of vaccine, we remain focused on vaccinating the most vulnerable veterans that are enrolled in VA healthcare. Although we would like to start vaccinating a broader group of veterans now, we do not yet have the supply to do that. But as supply increases, we are ready. VA has built a system with substantial capacity to deliver vaccine well beyond our current supply throughout the country. In fact, we are currently delivering virtually all of the doses that we received each week within days of receiving it. Throughout this pandemic, we've worked hard to simultaneously provide VA patients with the best possible care for COVID-19 and their other medical needs. Our hospitals and our clinics are open with thoughtfully increased safety measures being carried out by hardworking and innovative VA frontline staff. Veterans also have more options for virtual care now than ever before, built on the cutting edge telemedicine infrastructure that VA has been building for many years. In addition to taking care of veterans, VA has provided substantial support to both veterans outside of our facilities and non-veterans in communities throughout the country in what we call our fourth mission of serving as an emergency backstop to the national healthcare infrastructure. VA has to date accepted 124 fourth mission assignments from FEMA to protect veterans and non-veterans in 47 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and tribal governments. In many of these fourth mission assignments, highly skilled VA staff have volunteered to work alongside the staff of state-run veterans nursing homes because these facilities were shorthanded or needed specialized training in infection control techniques. VA has deployed well over 2,000 staff members on such assignments. And we have also hospitalized nearly 500 critically ill non-veteran civilians in VA facilities in areas of the country where local hospital bed capacity has become critically low. As VA's healthcare system reorients to this last mile of the pandemic, we recognize there is substantial deferred and delayed care amongst our veterans across the nation. And although we have been confident that the CARES Act funding will financially sustain us, we are beginning to recognize very significant unmet needs as veterans come back to us for care. In recognition of these needs, we have identified substantial additional requirements based on the length of the ongoing fight against the pandemic. The proposed American Rescue Plan will ensure that VHA can sustain and enhance our healthcare delivery and our readiness for any future challenges. These proposed resources will help our nation finally move beyond this pandemic. 
I want to conclude by saying thank you to all of the 364,000 VHA employees for continuing to fight this battle every single day, keeping our nation's veterans and their communities safe. I am also grateful to this subcommittee for your partnership and your leadership, and I look forward to your questions. Madam Chair, thank you so much. This concludes my remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Stone. We, uh, we appreciate your vigilance and the accessibility and our ability to be able to make sure that we can have regular communication with you and the leadership team at the VA throughout this, throughout this pandemic. Um, so we will proceed in the standard five minute rounds, recognizing members in order of seniority as they were seated uh, at the beginning of the hearing, alternating between majority and minority. Um, just be mindful of your time and allow the witnesses time, ideally, to answer within your five minute turn. Um, I'm going to begin with the subject of eligibility for the vaccine. I have a variety of questions, including um, one that I want to ask about related to PPE, but I'll begin with eligibility. Dr. Stone, as you know, there have been reports, uh, many from my home state of Florida, which is why I'm asking this question first, of veterans who meet all the CDC criteria for a vaccination being turned away from receiving the vaccine at a VA facility because they aren't currently enrolled in VA healthcare. In some of the cases, the veteran may actually be eligible for VA healthcare, but then, but they're not enrolled in the system. What is VA doing to help these veterans enroll in the VA healthcare system? Are you doing anything proactive to reach out to veterans who are not currently enrolled? And I know I've expressed to the department and to Secretary McDonough how important it is and we make sure that vaccines are getting to the widest universe of veterans that are possible. I mean, a particularly tricky issue is that of veterans who are not eligible for VA healthcare but need access to a vaccine. <clears throat> there are ways that VA can meet the needs of this population, such that without Congress stepping in and making any, any uh, statutory change, like negotiating with HHS on the terms of VA's vaccine, vaccine use agreement, or with FEMA, for example, to develop a fourth mission assignment that would allow for vaccinating uh, you know, non-VA eligible veterans. What's the status of those conversations with HHS and FEMA? We want you to think creatively and explore all the options to really reach this population because so many of them don't even realize that they can't just walk into VA and, and make an appointment and, uh, and get a vaccine. So can you talk with, that, uh, with us about how you are approaching both eligible VA veterans as well as non-eligible veterans to get access to the vaccine? So we have uh, 9.3 million enrolled veterans. Uh, about uh, just under 6 million of them are active users of the VA healthcare system. Uh, the CDC and HHS have granted us uh, 6 million doses for veteran use, uh, 400,000 for employee use. Those will come on a weekly basis. Uh, at the current time, we're receiving about 140,000 doses a week that's divided between those. We got some additional supply for um, uh, DHS uh, to do about 23,000 of their uh, employees. Uh, so for those that are enrolled, that have depended on us as a safety net for them, uh, they are our first priority. We do recognize, however, that there is substantial areas of the country where veterans are not coming in to get their vaccination. In one area of New York alone, in a single catchment area, uh, over a thousand veterans over age 75 said, no, thank you. Uh, and that surprised us. So we do have some supply and therefore we are enrolling veterans on the spot and our direction to uh, the VISN leadership is to do everything they can to enroll veterans who are eligible on the spot. Unfortunately, we do not have the supply to reach to veterans who are ineligible for uh, care in the VA at this time. And uh, that has created some very unfortunate situations that um, really has troubled all of us. But our ability to reach uh, this veteran population is entirely based on the supply of but the vaccine Stone, at this time. I can time. just interrupt you for a moment. As I said, you do have the ability to negotiate with HHS and, and FEMA to be able to alter your vaccine use agreement and try to be creative utilizing either a fourth mission assignment or 
making other adjustments, which wouldn't require statutory changes uh, that are unrelated to supply. So, I mean, certainly when you have more supply, if you, you still wouldn't be able to under your, you know, without this creative negotiation, be able to vaccinate people who are not eligible for VA benefits. So what are you doing, if anything, to try to creatively make sure that we can provide that access once we do have more supply? I'm sure Dr. Matthews will have additional comments, but let me say that we are actively talking to HHS and CDC, and it is our desire to get vaccine to into as many ve veterans as we possibly can. And I'll defer to Dr. Matthews for any additional comments. That would be helpful. I think uh, I think the difficulty um, <laughs> I think the difficulty uh, with this deployment of the vaccine, this administration is is definitely based on on supply chain and and unfortunately the need to go by priority levels. That's not something that we've needed to do in 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 large efforts like uh, we're seeing now. In the sense that the CDC guidance does lay out based on risk stratification, um, what order uh, veterans or actually the, the public at large uh, is to receive the vaccine. So I know Dr. Matthews, but I, that would, I, I realize all of that, I, I, but if you had supply and once we have supply, those categories only exist because of the need to ration what we have and prioritize the distribution of the vaccine based on people who are the most at risk. But once we are past the supply issue. VA would still have a problem not being able to vaccinate veterans who aren't eligible technically for VA healthcare. So you have the ability to negotiate with FEMA and HHS to be able to make some alterations so that you can make them eligible because it's a natural place that veterans would want to be able to get access to, their vac to a vaccine. What are you doing once there is supply and we're past that issue what are you doing to be able to make sure that you can do that? So we are actively and on a daily basis discussing with FEMA the idea of bringing this in under a fourth mission. We've had four different states now ask us for that type of support, and we're quite pleased uh, at some of the progress being made in a number of the states as we look at uh, bringing in some of uh, their supply to support that type of, uh, of, in, uh, of uh, vaccination program. But what I do promise you is that you and I share the same desire to make sure that every veteran in America is vaccinated. And as we begin to reach higher levels of uh, percentage of, uh, of veterans that are vaccinated and the supply chain improves, we will continue to push every single day to reach the goal that I think you and I share. Thank you. My time's expired. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Rutherford, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Stone, uh, uh, across the country, uh, you know, VA's doctors and nurses and, and other healthcare workers have, have really stepped up, I, I, I think, to serve this pandemic. Oftentimes, as you mentioned, in that fourth uh, initiative or effort, um, and, and you, you mentioned that you've added 80,000 staff uh, with the 17 billion uh, out of the CARES Act. Can, can you tell me a little bit about how, so obviously the pandemic resulted in a lot more staff need. Can you talk to me a little bit about how did the pandemic affect your healthcare staff? Uh, you know, what, what's been the experience of the staff dealing with, uh, other than uh, obviously the 131 uh, tragic lives that have been lost uh, to this disease uh, but by your staff. Can you talk about the other impact that it's had? Uh, let me answer in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, number one, uh, we have been extraordinarily impressed with the number of people applying for jobs at the VHA. It's been extraordinary. And people's desire to join this mission, uh, healthcare workers, has just been extraordinary, uh, resulting in our ability with the help of Office of Personnel Management been able to reduce dramatically uh, our ability to hire. Um, in fact, over 20% of the hires we're now doing are done within three days. Yeah. Now, how has this affected our healthcare workers? 
Um, our healthcare workers, both clinical and non-clinical, uh, are coming to work at higher rates than they ever have. The amount of vacation taken is at unprecedented and historic low rates, especially in areas that are getting hard, hit hardest by the pan pandemic. Uh, over the storms that you discussed that have affected members of the subcommittee, uh, we have had employees volunteering to stay in our hospitals, sometimes three and four nights, uh, and to sleep in the hospital to be sure that they can get here uh, to care for veterans at the bedside. So it's been extraordinary. Now, uh, on any given day prior to vaccination, we were running 5,000 to 6,000 employees who could not get to work uh, based on the fact uh, that they had either been exposed or had COVID. That number. Well, what was that number again, doctor? About 6,000. 6,000 a day. A day. That number with vaccination and the aggressive vaccination uh, plan that we've had for our employees on a volunteer basis uh, in some of our hospitals, we're now at over 90% of the personnel are now vaccinated. And in response to that, this morning, the number of healthcare workers who could not come to work because of quarantine or the presence of COVID has dropped to 1,300. It's extraordinary what's happened. Wow. In essence, we've been able to bring three to 4,000 people every day back to work uh, because of our vaccination program and the willingness of our employees to take that vaccine. Thank you. That, that's, uh, that's very impressive. And uh, I, it, I, I think it shows the commitment of the people uh, working at VA to, uh, to get the job done in some really tough circumstances. Uh, let, let, let me ask you this. The, the CARES Act had 17 billion. Uh, you, obviously, you use that to bring on 80,000 staff. Uh, can, can you talk also uh, how the money was used, that $17 billion. And when we look at the American Rescue Plan coming in, uh, there's another $17 billion uh, being placed there. And I, and I know you said that you, you still have additional needs going forward. Um, I, I presume some of that would be to maintain the 80,000 staff. I mean, getting them on is not enough. you got to maintain them now. Uh, so you're going to have uh, staffing needs to continue. Uh, can you talk a little bit about did did where did the 17 billion in the American Rescue Plan come from, uh, and and did you request that specifically, or did or is that just an offer being made by the majority? Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, let me say a couple of things. Uh, we are in tremendous debt at the foresight that you all showed when the CARES Act was put together. And uh, quite honestly, I don't think any of us could see what the impact on America this was gonna have. And uh, we com committed or obligated uh, about six and a half billion of the original CARES Act dollars uh, in the last fiscal year, fiscal year 20. We'll commit the rest of it and obligate the rest of it during this fiscal year and uh, we have begun discussing uh, exactly what the long-term effect of this, uh, <clears throat> this pandemic means to us. And uh, we know that there's a huge impact on deferred and delayed care that will begin to come in. Uh, we know that there's a huge effect on unemployment uh, where people lose their health insurance and come to us as a safety net. We know that there is a uh, huge effect on the modernization of our systems that have been so challenged. You know, we operate a, a pretty old telephone system in many of the areas of, of the country. We need to modernize those phone systems. We need to move from the plastic that we've got up that has created over the last year, the negative airflow, to permanent changes in our facilities. We also need to recognize that uh, there may be another pandemic, there may be a variant, there may be an earthquake, and we need to begin to prepare ourselves to assure that we can not only complete our mission here, but also pick up whatever this nation may need, whether it be a uh, polar vortex that affects an, an entire region of the country, as you uh, referenced in your opening comments, or whether it is a, another major 
um, calamity that affects the American people. All of that goes into the American Rescue Plan that will allow us to modernize. Thank you, Dr. Stone. I see my time's expired. Uh, Madam Chair, if I could, I've, I've got several other questions I'd like to just submit if, if uh, we can in writing. Uh, yes, yeah, but, but, uh, and, and is this clock right? That was five minutes. Yeah, I <laughs> it know. Seems to running it. faster. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> right, thank, you. thank you very much, Dr. Stone. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Um, and now I'd like to recognize uh, Chairwoman DeLauro uh, for five minutes for her question. Uh, thank you uh, uh, so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Stone, let me just ask you this. Um, what is the um, what is the VA currently uh, doing with regard to standard of care for patients with COVID-19? Is it monoclonal antibodies, is it remdesivir, steroids? Um, and are you conducting any research into new COVID treatments, uh, prevention protocols, or additional vaccines? Yeah, Congresswoman uh, or Madam Chair, uh, yes, we are. Um, we've been involved in, in more than 70 of our medical centers in various research studies uh, that have allowed uh, a lot of the advances in, in care not only on vaccine, because we've involved in multiple sites on vaccines, but also in the work on monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies, the use of, of immune globulin plasma or recovered plasma that's been infused. And I'm sorry, you're, you're on mute. All right, there we go. Um, with, with regard to the standard of care, is it the monoclonal, remdesivir, steroids? Uh, what 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 are you doing for your patients with COVID? What are you, what what's what's the, the 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 standard of care? I I think that one of the things we need to recognize is that all of us are learning as we go with yeah. these new techniques. Yeah, no, but what what are you doing? If you've got a patient, what is that? What what are you doing for that patient? I understand well, what we're doing in terms of prevention and vaccines. And I, got, I just must say to you that one of the things, we found a 28, 29% decline rate. And you know what it was relative to, and I just put this off, is their caregiver, uh, they're afraid to go back home because the caregiver, their wife or spouse could not get it. But tell me, you got a patient, what, do you, what, 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 what is the course of treatment? Well, first of all, we know that uh, about 95 to 96% of patients with COVID will never need to be hospitalized. And it is simply for the vast majority. Those who are hospitalized, you've got somebody who is in your facility with COVID. What do you do every day? Do they just lie there until they get through it? Do you do, are there any drugs, any steroids? As I said, remdesivir, uh, what? It, it depends on the response of the patient, and there are, certainly what's most important is their oxygenation. And if their oxygen levels are running well and their cognitive functions are running well and they're not having problems, then uh, there, is, there is the watchful approach to this. But one of the things we've learned, Congresswoman, one of the things we've learned is that sometimes early intervention can have adverse outcomes. And I'm going to defer to Dr. Matthews as our chief medical well, look, officer to add additional detail. Well, this is what I want because I, I have limited time and I know there are many other members who want to ask questions. Please, all I want to know is that from you and from Dr. Matthews, if you can get back and how are you treating the patients that you have that, that are uh, in, infected with COVID-19? Let me just, if I can, ask another and i would also like as an addendum to that the federal agencies that you are working with because you said you are working on research so we know what what you, you know the collaboration there quick question on men, mental health um reaching out to veterans how are you dealing with the issues with regard to uh to to mental health um uh, uh you know is it proactive uh, uh outreach uh versus you know, answering calls through the veterans crisis line. Um, and what are you anticipating in terms of increased mental health services? Yeah. Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. I, 
this is this is a huge priority um, for uh, our staff across the country. We have proactively really made an effort to assure that the mental health screening is is not uh, our more traditional uh, at, at traditional intervals of requests, but instead with every interaction with a veteran that we are asking about their mental health concerns um, because we know with the increased isolation and difficulties, particularly even from an economic standpoint over the last year, it's gotten more difficult. So yes, proactive outreach is actually increasing. Okay, um, we have uh, at the same time seen increased utilization of our veterans crisis line. Not necessarily all due to the pandemic. There's also been the mm -hmm. increase with the 988 function through a couple of, of cell phone services. So we're we're seeing increased uh, uh, interaction with veterans through that service. But it, it both, both proactive and reactive, uh, we're really focused. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My time has run out. If you can also let us know how many doses of COVID-19 does the VA have? You can just get back uh, to the chair. Uh, and the uh, ranking member. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. You mean of the doses of the vaccine? Doses of the vaccine, yes. Yeah. Okay. Many okay. I'm sorry. Right. And also, also, if we can make sure, Dr. Stone, that you answered uh, Chairwoman DeLauro's question on how many uh, VA patients who have COVID for the record, that would be very helpful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next up is uh, Mr. Daladeo. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. First off, uh, Dr. Stone, Dr. Matthews, thank you for joining us today. My district in California is home to thousands of veterans and their health care is a top priority for me. COVID-19 has put an incredible strain on our nation. And I applaud the thousands of men and women working in the veterans health facilities who are on the front lines caring for those who served our country. As your to testimony today uh, demonstrates, VA has been leading the nation in COVID's response. I'm encouraged to see your advances in telehealth and your successful vaccination program. While uh, much is to be done, there's still much more that needs to be uh, put behind to put this pandemic behind us. My first question, Dr. Stone, I'm pleased to see how efficiently you've been distributing vaccinations. However, I'm concerned about the vaccine access for ve uh, veterans in rural communities. Many of these veterans must travel long distances to get to a VA facility, and many are unable to travel. How are you planning to get vaccines uh, to veterans who live in these rural communities? Uh, Congressman, I share your concern. Nobody's tried to do this before, and uh, this has been a tough one. And uh, we have done some demonstration projects up in the in uh, Montana, as well as yesterday in Alaska, where we flew vaccine in on small uh, aircraft uh, that was short uh, uh, takeoff and, and landing capability to get uh, vaccine in. We landed on an island in Alaska yesterday and vaccinated 50 veterans. Uh, we've encouraged each of the visions and provided resources to each of our regional healthcare leaders to examine how best to get into rural and highly rural areas. Uh, we are not doing as well with rural veterans in reaching them as we would like to. And although we've reached 18% of the enrolled and, and active user veteran population of the VA, uh, we need to do better with highly rural and uh, so it is through these uh, activities that we are also mobilizing uh, some of our mobile vet centers uh, with refrigeration capacity on board in order to bring them, uh, bring vaccine into remote areas. And we've now reached out to over 300 sites that we're given vaccine at, but in small communities and rural communities, uh, this, is a, this is a tough uh, Herculean effort to get to where we need to be. Are you partnering with any other organizations outside of the Veterans uh, Network? Uh, yes, we've been partnering with uh, Native American organizations, uh, Alaskan Native uh, organizations that we partnered. Uh, what we we went into an Alaskan Native uh, health care clinic yesterday to do 50 veterans. Uh, I mean, that's what, most, yeah. what I meant by the question was my, mainly clinics. I mean, I'm in a pretty rural area, and so we have a lot of rural health care clinics, and I, I think a lot of those are very close to where a lot of these veterans live and hopefully you're able to partner with some of them and have that ability. If not, I'd love for you to have that ability. If that's an issue, um, please reach out to us on that one. I also wanted to follow up on Deloro's uh, comments or Chairwoman Deloro's comments on the suicide. Uh, veteran suicide is something I'm deeply concerned about. 
This pandemic has pushed many people into isolation. The CARES Act provided funding for short-term agreements with telecommunications companies to deliver free or reduced mental health care service to our veterans. Is this program being utilized by our veterans? Uh, yes, indeed it is. Uh, again, as, as I referenced earlier, the, the Veterans Crisis Line is, is actually seeing increased utilization. Um, and indeed, our, our staff is, is managing that quite well. I actually look at that data on a, a daily basis um, and, and uh, are, are quite proud with the, the handoffs that we're able to provide to just assure that these veterans are getting services uh, during that extreme emergent time. Is there any plans to continue that service once the, the pandemic is over? Yes, our, our veterans crisis line is 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 sustainable. We're looking at longer term strategy as as more veterans are using the line, uh, but definitely that will be sustained. All right, and I don't think I have time to ask one more question, so I'll yield back uh, to the chairwoman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valadeo. Um, uh, next, I would like to recognize uh, former ranking member and vice chair of the subcommittee, Mr. Bishop, for five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Stone and Dr. Matthews, for uh, participating with us this afternoon. Uh, and uh, Dr. Stone, uh, let me thank you uh, for your service to the nation. Uh, you had over 20 years of service in the Army and continued service both in private and government and serving veterans, and that truly captures your dedication. Uh, but I want to follow up uh, and just reemphasize uh, Mr. Valadeo. Uh, made it pretty. Uh, he asked uh, what my main concern is at this point is uh, how we are going to uh, actually service the veterans who live in rural communities. Uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines uh, are required, as you know, to be uh, stored and transported uh, in extremely cold temperatures. And of course, many of our, uh, most of our rural communities don't have them. And of course, uh, uh, that, that creates a problem. And the other uh, uh, thing that uh, uh, if you utilize mobile health vehicles, uh, they perhaps uh, uh, would not be able to be stored uh, uh, with that, those extremely low temperatures. So uh, he, can you provide us with a specific uh, plan uh, within the next uh, few, few days uh, as to how you will actually reach those veterans? Uh, the idea of partnerships uh, is great, and uh, uh, because there are uh, rural uh, health uh, rural health centers uh, that are uh, available to provide uh, uh, health care, and there are some of our larger health centers that are serving rural communities. Uh, and if you were partnering with uh, some of the local uh, health centers that work in rural communities, uh, that could also be a vehicle. Uh, but uh, that that is a, a concern, and I hope that you can get us some specifics uh, on how that distribution will be will be done for our rural uh, veterans. Uh, we have over thirty thousand veterans that live in the Philippines, and I was told that uh, uh, that the uh, veterans that are being actively treated in the Manila VA clinic are the only ones that will be vaccinated in the Philippines. And of course, if they are not able to, uh, uh, if they're not being treated in Manila, that means that the, the remainder of them will not have access to treatment. And the president, of course, said on Wednesday that every American who wants a vaccine should be able to get one. And certainly, uh, veterans should be among that number. Uh, and the final, let me ask my question quickly because my time is uh, uh, spending. Uh, what more? Does Congress need to do, if anything, uh, through authorities or appropriations to make sure that you can uh, accomplish the job of uh, reaching uh, our veterans? Uh, and of course, uh, we appreciate what you've done so far, but we need some specifics. Certainly, the dialogue and debate that we are having around the American Rescue Plan is. Uh, is, is part of this discussion of what resources is it going to take to reach out to, to virtually every area where there is an American veteran. Uh, secondly, there is some support that we will need under the authorities that we have to treat in foreign countries. Uh, in foreign countries, as you know, we are strictly limited by statute uh, to treat only service-connected illness. And therefore, for those veterans that are not enrolled in foreign <laughs> countries, uh, what authorities do we have to either pay the bill to another country 
uh, for a vaccination uh, or to actually deliver vaccine through the State Department. We've been in active discussions with the State Department uh, regarding the Philippines and uh, the State Department personnel in the Philippines, to my knowledge, as of this morning, have not received vaccine either. And therefore, uh, we are actively looking and seeking for ways to reach every single veteran we possibly can. Well, my time is about expended, but uh, I, I would like very much uh, for you to, to give us a, a follow-up uh, with uh, some more specifics. Uh, those, those are rather general responses, and of course, veterans uh, I'm hearing from uh, uh, having difficulty actually getting the vaccine in the arms. So uh, would you please uh, respond to, to the committee uh, uh, after the hearing and, and give us some more specifics, please, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Bishop. Appreciate your uh, your thoughtful questions and Mr. Gonzalez, you're recognized for five minutes for your question. Thank you, Chairwoman. And I want to thank uh, Chairwoman DeLauro for being on the call. It just highlights how important veterans are, not only to our subcommittee, but to our committee as a whole and how committed we are to it. You know, I'm a, I'm a 20 year veteran. I get my care through the VA system. Uh, I haven't always been happy, as many veterans haven't always been happy. But I want to thank, you know, Dr. Uh, Stone and Dr. Um, uh, Matthews for your work on what you've done with the COVID vaccinations. Uh, it has been very, very positive. Uh, I just want to highlight that to not only to you, but to the 460,000 plus employees of the VA. I know, I know it hasn't always been easy to be an employee of the VA, but you should be proud of the work that you've done. Having said that, we have a lot of work ahead of us, right? And part of that is, is thinking outside of the box. I mean, you've heard from countless members on this committee as far as uh, getting getting uh, our rural areas uh, vaccinated. And I would I would ask, uh, or I would just mention that access is the number one thing with, with, that people are trying, that veterans are trying to get is is access. So you know, I, I would highlight if you could give us specific programs that have worked specific areas that you've been successful on gaining access to we would love to take a look at that and happy to fund those areas you don't have to do that now but i would just say you know specifics one takeaway now i want to get into the the nuts and bolts of things so i know the va has approximately 10 billion in remaining cares act funding my question to you is what do you plan to use those funds for uh, the majority will be used for health care. The remainder will be used uh, for things like PPE uh, and, uh, and to continue to strengthen our emergency re response capability uh, to sustain ourselves throughout the, uh, the current pandemic. Uh, as you know, we have uh, had, uh, even in your state, we've had mobile assets deployed, including a mobile ICU. We will continue to sustain and expand that capability, uh, both under the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan uh, is the plan. And we'd be happy to provide you with a complete breakdown of, uh, of how those that $10 billion will be extended, expended this year. Thank you. No, that would be very helpful. You know, I, I also want to highlight, uh, you know, my district is over 800 miles of Texas and Mexico border. And one thing that, um, Y'all were able to do the VA system in the uh, South Texas Veterans Healthcare System was able to do was provide vaccinations to our uh, uh, Border Patrol agents, which are so critical. So I just want to thank you for that. And I want to just highlight again what we really need at this junction is some outside the box thinking, whether that's pilot programs or elsewhere to be helpful. I, I want to add one other thing while we're talking about about outside the box thinking is it's important for us to focus on the here and now. Absolutely. Right. We have to get through this pandemic together. We got to look, we got to, we got to work together to get through that. But I want to talk also about what comes next. And look, I'm a cryptologist. I spent 20 years uh, in the cyber field. And one thing that worries me is a cyber storm is heading our way. So imagine if, you know, our, our VA facilities are shut down, not due to a storm, 
not due to something else, but due to cyber intrusions. So I would ask that you take back, you know, what are some things that you're looking forward on? You know, you talked about modernizing the VA system in general. Uh, you know, I would, I would ask, you don't have to respond now, but I would ask that you look at some of the cyber intrusions because we're at risk. There's gonna come a day that, you know, state sponsored actors attack our healthcare infrastructure and our VA system is certainly part of that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, and uh, I agree, and I appreciate you uh, raising that issue. That is definitely something that needs to be looked into. We, we can't possibly expect that, uh, that the VA isn't vulnerable to, to that type of attack. Um, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Case uh, from the great state of Hawaii for five minutes of questions. Good morning, aloha to all. Uh, Dr. Stone, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to add uh, my appreciation to the incredible employees of, of the VHA uh, who are doing incredible work. So um, I agree very much with, with what you said earlier along those lines. And <clears throat> I also wanna commend to you the, the efforts of your, your new uh, VA Pacific Islands Healthcare direct, uh, System uh, Director, uh, Dr. Adam Robinson, who, who's come out here and really taken a, a good solid objective look at, at where to improve. Uh, certainly great communication uh, with, with the partners uh, throughout the Pacific and I think the largest geographically and certainly one of the most complicated areas of, of our country and, and system to, to deliver uh, high quality health care to, to our veterans and families. Uh, one of the things that he is uh, focused on um, is, is, is trying to <clears throat> uh, cross, um, uh, trying, to, trying, to, you, trying, to, trying to assemble critical mass from the available resources. Uh, so as an example, uh, partnering much more with the DOD at Tripler Army Medical Center, which is co-located uh, on the same uh, place with um, the Spark Matsunaga VA uh, system, um, a healthcare center uh, to really uh, cross-utilize specialists uh, where one system or the other can't maintain specialists uh, um, on, a, on an isolated basis, also with our local community. So um, you might wanna take a look at some of the, the work that he is doing here as it, there may be instructive uh, areas where you can, you can do the same. Uh, in other similar situated areas throughout the country. I think we've talked about this before um, on hearings, but I just uh, mentioned that to you. Let me, um, let me cover um, a, an incredibly tragic uh, situation that occurred here uh, in, in Hawaii uh, last August where a COVID-19 outbreak began at the Yukio Otsuku uh, State Veterans Home in my, my hometown of Hilo. This is a state-operated veterans home um, the VA does not directly uh, operate it, uh, but um, at that facility, we saw about 71 out of 89 residents actually contract uh, COVID-19, of which 27 died. So 38% of the veterans at that home died of COVID-19, and, and many of the employees were, were uh, um, infected as well. Um, and and uh, great appreciation to the VA for sending out your Tiger team to assist with that really critical um, um, uh, situation. Um, there's a lot of fallout still that's going on from that. But one of the areas that um, I wanted to focus on with you was, was uh, the extent to which uh, state veterans homes, not directly under your jurisdiction, uh, need to report to the VA on how, um, and for that matter, how the VA is overseeing uh, the care of veterans in state uh, operated homes. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that at present, um, uh, those homes are not required to actually uh, report up the chain to the VA in any way, shape, or form on, on uh, COVID-19 uh, statistics. Um, and uh, this is clearly, to me, uh, not an acceptable situation if what we're trying to do is to, is, is to prevent uh, Otsuku-style uh, um, um, uh, tragedies from occurring elsewhere. And so I just wanted to ask you, are, are, what are the issues, what are the plans, what are the issues in terms of actual oversight of state veterans homes uh, for veterans, especially in a COVID-19 uh, high intensity and high emergency environment. Congressman, we, uh, I believe, and I may be wrong, and, and Dr. Matthews will correct me, that under the, what we're calling the mega bus that uh, was passed, there is a requirement for us to actually put infection rates uh, and uh, employee, um, compliance rates uh, on a website, and I think we've done so uh, for the state veterans homes, but the relationship 
between us and the state veterans homes is one that needs to continually be strengthened. Uh, we have now been in over 100 of the 154 state veterans homes providing various types of support, like you saw with the Tiger team in Hawaii. Um, we need to make sure that our inspections are adequate, that those inspections are communicated not only to the management oversight, but also to the governor's office directly. There is a proud relationship between states and their veterans, and we do not want to intervene in, in the middle of that. But I think governor's offices deserve the reports directly and when we have concerns to have them expressed directly to them. Is it is it clear at this point that the veterans homes, state veterans homes, do have to uh, report those statistics to the Veterans Administration? I understand that you put the stats up, but do they ha ha actually have to give you those stats under the uh, mega books? I know that we're required to post them and we're we're required to post non-compliance. But the control of the state veterans homes is within the governor. And uh, to my knowledge, everyone that I'm aware of has cooperated thus far. And uh, I will correct the record if I'm wrong in that. And Dr. Matthews may have more. Okay, thanks. Well, my time is up, so I'll, I'll come back to this uh, on, on round two. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Case. Uh, Ms. Pringley, you're recognized for five minutes for your question. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing on, on such a critically important topic to um, all of our veterans. Thank you, Dr. Stone and Dr. Matthews. I really appreciate your testimony and the hard work you've been putting in on this um, in this challenging time. And my sympathy goes out to the many families of the employees who have passed away working with our veterans. That's really a tragic number. Uh, I have some parochial question. I do appreciate the questions that have already been asked because many of my um, my own questions were covered, but um, I represent the state of Maine. We have the third highest percentage of veterans per capita in the country, um, although we're a small population state. So my understanding, and as I said, this would be parochial, um, is that our uh, health center in Maine has received about, is receiving about 300 doses a week. And first I want to put this in the context that I understand overall supply is an issue, you know, whether it's with the VA or in all of our states, and we're hoping to see increased supply as time goes on. But um, this is kind of a comparison and fairness issue. So 300 doses a week is what we're receiving now. At that rate, it would take us until 2024 to vaccinate all of the veterans in Maine. And of course, we're hoping that the number increases. Um, but our understanding is that Massachusetts, and you should understand we have a huge rivalry with our southern state, um, but they're receiving about a thousand a week. And while they have a higher population, um, what I was led to believe was that they're able to have uh, sufficient doses that they're um, vaccinating people down to the age of 50, where we have to stick with the 75 and above. So I just wanna make sure that the distribution is equitable and that states like ours, which of course are doing a good job covering the veterans, um, will be able to get increased supply in the future and that the Percentages that are being distributed to each state are fair and based on the need in the state. Uh, Congresswoman, um, we have run into this in some of the uh, lower population states. And uh, I appreciate you bringing this to my attention. Uh, there are, uh, we're at about 10% on your veteran population have been immunized, uh, at least with their first dose. Uh, we've ex we've uh, actually, I think, sent only Moderna vaccine into the state uh, to the tune of about 7,000 doses. If that is inequitable, we are distributing based on to the Vizen level, and then the Vizens are redistributing. Uh, I will take that uh, to the Vizen leadership and uh, make sure that we take a look at it, and then our team will communicate with you of do we have to think we have it right or not, and we can open a dialogue on that. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I think you're right. Um, we've been getting the Moderna and I think in Massachusetts, they get the Pfizer. And I don't know if that creates some of the inequity, but anyway, having you look into that and um, anything that we can do to speed up the process will be important. Um, I just have one other quick question on the state veteran homes um, that I know Mr. Case already asked you about. Um, but I, I think that our veteran homes have been able to complete their initial round of vaccinations, um, or they're on track to do it by mid-March. 
Um, but they're concerned about the follow on access to vaccines for new admissions and new staff and just want to make sure that that's part of the mix um, once they complete the current uh, residence. All of that uh, distribution of vaccine has been handled through the states, okay. not through VHA. Uh, we have the same concern. Uh, there is a substantial amount of discharges and admissions to our 134 uh, chronic living facilities uh, to the tune of about 1% of the population transitions each day. And uh, so we are having the same problem and having the same discussions with uh, HHS and CDC about the distribution of vaccine in these future rounds as those changes occur. That's great to know, and we can uh, take up that issue with the state. So again, thank you for your attention to my first question, and, and thank you so much for your, your service and your continued work for our veterans. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Pingree. Um, Mr. Christ, I think you uh, you seem to have a good techno technological situation right now, so you're, you're recognized for five minutes for your question. Did I speak too soon? <laughs> Mr. Chris, can oh. you? We're having a little trouble hearing you. Do you want to try calling in by phone if, if the um, sound is the issue? Can you, can, you, my, can you hear me now? Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. You're recognized. I, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your, uh, not surprisingly, you focus on some things that are of great concern to me as well, uh, primarily in the way of uh, distribution. But I want to thank Dr. Stone and thank uh, Dr. Matthews for being with us this afternoon. Um, and, and just a couple of questions uh, first, uh, Dr. Stone, if I could. I'm curious. Uh, how many doses of vaccine does the VA have or been given? Uh, I will need to get you the exact number unless uh, Dr. Matthews has it in front of her. Of uh, But it's, uh, Cam, do you have it? Uh, no, I don't have it. Well, an, an approximate number would be fine, Dr. Stone. Um, Please. It appears that, um, I, I I don't want to speculate. I know that we've got about 98 to 99 percent of our first doses out, uh, which are more than uh, a million doses. And uh, we have about 90 percent uh, to 92 percent of our second doses out. And uh, but uh, we were getting a large amount of Moderma that was coming in today. And whatever number I give you is going to be inaccurate because we we've had uh, a lot of uh, of variants based on weather across the nation and delayed deliveries. So Dr. Matthews has some good numbers, I think. I think I found them, sir. About 2 million doses shipped we have. And again, over the past week or so, there's been difficulty uh, with some of those shipments. Um, and, and that, of course, is divided. It includes both first and second doses, which we're tracking separately, but about 2 million. About 2 million total doses. About how many have been administered to veterans? To, to, vet to veterans to date? Um, about 1,064,000 as of this morning first doses uh, have, been, have been in. And then I can't give you the second dose uh, mix at this point. So, how many total veterans have received the vaccine, one or two? Uh, over a million. Over a million. And how many total veterans do we have in the country today? Uh, in the country, 18.5 million. And how many of those are qualified for care under the veterans' health care system? At the current time, there is 9.5 million enrolled in VA care and 6 million, uh, just under 6 million that are active users. Okay, so, well, I, I think some of the frustration you may uh, feel from members of the committee is that uh, 
a lot of people aren't getting vaccinated yet, <laughs> you know, just to put a fine point on it. And um, the, I know we have weather issues in the country right now. I get that and I understand it and I appreciate it. Um, but in terms of trying to save lives, which is what this is all about, um, you know, if there are ways, and you've asked us, we've asked you in different ways how to be more creative, so to speak, to use the chairwoman's uh, terminology. And and I love it because, you know, we're at a point, this is a crisis. And so people need to get care and they need to have their lives saved, if at all possible. And if we have two million doses and one million or so have been administered, there's a million outstanding that aren't getting the care that they need now, today, yesterday, frankly. Um, so if I speak with some tone of urgency, it's because I have empathy. And these aren't just numbers of people in my state of Florida and the chair's state of Florida and Mr. Rutherford's state of Florida. Uh, sadly, about 200 or fellow Floridians are dying every day. I don't know what the breakdown is as it relates to veterans specific, but we have a ton of veterans in the Sunshine State. And so my plea, uh, if you will, is um, my hope my prayer, frankly, is that we can get more of these uh, doses administered in a more rapid fashion uh, as soon as possible. And I, I thank you for your time and I yield back, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for your leadership. Congressman, um, we share your empathy and with the uh, Madam Chair, your your tolerance of my response. Uh, we, we have gotten out, we'll get to the exact numbers. I, I have virtually no first doses left today as we sit here they are in many? veterans arms i will get you exact numbers our second doses are not being tapped because we need to keep them to ensure that we give adequate immunizations and so we will get you exact numbers of where we sit as of the testimony today but we share your empathy and we share in the horror of the losses uh, and we share the sense of urgency every single day as we work this pandemic Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. God bless you. Thank you so much, Mr. Christ. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Um, next up uh, is the gentlewoman from the great state of Nevada, Ms. Lee. You're recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stone and Dr. Matthews for being here with us today. Um, I just recently, I had the chance to talk to uh, the staff of the Southern Nevada Healthcare System, VA Healthcare System. And as you know, uh, Nevada's first COVID case uh, was a veteran. And over the past year, we've been grateful to you and your team uh, for working to seek best practices from the field and working to share those with facilities as they uh, deal with the pandemic. And I wanted to know, how are you saving the institutional knowledge so that we don't make the same mistakes should, you know, God forbid we have another pandemic? Uh, Congresswoman, we uh, created a uh, sort of in progress through June, from January to June, um, document that that um, is an after action report. We will supplement that with an annex that carries us through the uh, vaccine that we're working on now, so that 10 years from now, five years from now, 25 years from now, we can uh, we can really memorialize and and make sure that uh, those that come after us, we'll learn the lessons of what we've learned as we've moved through this. Thank you. And it's always the law of averages. As soon as I start asking questions, my dogs start barking. <laughs> anyway, uh, I wanted to also talk about, I had a chance to speak to our state veterans home director, and she stated that they're in the process of moving from uh, their units from two bedroom units or converting them to one beds trying to stop the spread of contagious diseases like COVID. And the American Rescue Plan proposes $500 million uh, for the VA to provide construction to states' veterans' homes. And I just wanted to ask, as we're hopefully exiting this uh, pandemic, can you talk about issues that state veterans' homes have had and ways that this $500 million can help them uh, update their infrastructure? I think the creation of, uh, of negative pressure rooms uh, is absolutely essential, even in this environment. Uh, the creation of neighborhoods 
uh, which is quite a bit different than the way many of those structures are built. The creation of neighborhoods that don't force employees to cross over between areas that reduces the chance of an employee carrying the, vac the uh, disease from one area to another. Uh, and I'm going to defer to Dr. Matthews for additional comments. No, you, uh, nothing to add. You hit the, the major points. Uh, the traditional architecture for the state veterans homes needs to be updated to allow for, for more appropriate physical distancing. Yeah, we have, um, as part of the CARES Act, there was uh, some funds set aside. We've begun to get, we've got 28, I think, proposals for construction in uh, from um, the, uh, the state veterans homes uh, that we will be awarding. Uh, I think we, we look forward to the American Rescue Plan supplementing that to really uh, move these to a model for the rest of American long-term health care. Great. That's uh, actually, uh, I, you know, I can't agree more. So um, one question I want to talk to going, focusing on employees and their mental health. Um, you know, I had the chance to talk to our officials here at the VA and we talked about the toll that, especially it now being almost a year that the COVID deaths are having on the staff and the resources that uh, the VA health system uh, were providing. And I actually worry about obviously mental health issues, PTSD with our staff members. And could you talk about potential budget requests to ensure that the medical staff at the VHA have the necessary resources they need to cope with the residual trauma and stress uh, from dealing with COVID-19. We have been, um, this has been tough. And I will tell you, even in, in the central office, this has been some of the toughest work I've ever done, including combat. And I will tell you that um, our employee support services our National Center for Organizational Development, even our vet centers have been engaged in bringing assets uh, where we've, we've had large numbers of employees affected. But the effect on the employees hasn't been just disease. It's been the changes in what's happening to their families. It's been about moms that are struggling with, uh, with caring for their children that aren't in organized school all day. Uh, everybody's lives have been turned upside down. It's the inability to take care of elderly family members because you just can't get in to see them in an institution. And so all of those stressors have been supported by every bit of asset we would bring to the veteran, we have turned to the employee. And I think it's why our employees have done so well. You know, even our retirements are down in the last year as people want to stay with their team Employees want to stay with their team to continue to do the work and are connected to this extraordinary mission. Thank you. I'm finished and I, I yield. Thank you, Dr. Stone, and thank you, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Um, to wrap up our first round of questions, I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Trone, five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to follow up on Congresswoman Lee's uh, line of questioning, it's great you're focusing on the, the workers themselves that are in the VA, but uh, talk a little bit about uh, how the VA's responded uh, to ensure continuity of care for our veterans after we've had this COVID depression, anxiety, loss of so many people. How are we helping those in the VA itself? What have you done there, the, the veterans themselves? Sorry, thank you so much for that question. Um, I, uh, I I think we need to recognize really the strength of our integrated health system and our ability to have shifted face-to-face -face care to telehealth. That in and of itself, allowing their uh, continuity providers, either in primary care or mental health specialty, to continue to communicate and, and provide services to our veterans uh, through unprecedented amount of telehealth um, really has has allowed us to continue services in, a, in an effort that um, unfortunately face-to-face -face care wouldn't have been able to provide in, in as safe of a manner. So we really do credit telemedicine uh, for allowing continuity to continue both in the VA as well as community care, as well as the private sector telehealth has, has grown significantly. Now, there's no question about uh, one of the 
few positives come out of the pandemic has been the success of telehealth in particular. Telemental health uh, have been absolute total winners uh, everywhere we talk. Jumping on to another uh, byproduct, an unfortunate byproduct of the pandemic, maybe Dr. Matthews could respond. Uh, one of my districts, uh, counties up 111% in opioid deaths, overdoses, uh, year over year since this pandemic started. So talk a little bit about what the VA has done to take proactive steps to help our vets uh, in recovery and uh, get substance use disorder treatment uh, during this pandemic. It's it's a great question, sir. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. This is of equal uh, and, and quite alarming concern, uh, increased substance uh, usage over the past year with the pandemic uh, is is tied to, to so much. Um, what we've tr been trying to promote, and admittedly we need to increase um, awareness of, uh, is converting a lot of our group visits for substance use uh, through our RRT program, RRTP program. Um, converting a lot of that to a virtual virtual modality as well. There's been some reticence there, um, particularly uh, actually from both veterans as well as providers, but we are really pushing the margins, uh, working on communications to really encourage that sort of work. Additionally, um, medication assisted treatment, MAT, uh, in order to treat opioid uh, disorders uh, is, is definitely being promoted widely. I myself am a MAT uh, prescriber. Uh, and, and that can be done either through mental health, substance use, uh, uh, addiction specialists, or primary care. Uh, and so expanding that opportunity, making sure that substance use disorder isn't just uh, within a specialty mental health setting, but within primary care and wraparound services as a whole is another piece that we're definitely promoting. Okay, great. So there's no question we need to continue to support you on substance use and mental health because our vets are really paying a disproportionate price uh, with the COVID layered layer on top of an already challenging areas. Talk a second, uh, if you could, about the long haulers. Uh, these folks that are getting muscle pain, they're getting, you know, brain fog and, you know, fatigue, shortness of breath. What is the VA doing or how are you addressing this subset of long haulers who COVID just didn't go away? Uh, this is this is one of as a, a clinician myself. This is this is one of the scary points of COVID that we have very little data how to address, how to potentially treat or even prevent some of these symptoms. That's why I think the work that Dr. Stone described earlier, it, our clinical trials, is so critical. We are from a data standpoint because of the size of our system, uh, really collecting more of that longitudinal data probably uh, than more than any other health system is even capable for. And so we really hope that we'll be able to see something from that analysis, um, hopefully more in the short term. But again, the long-term effects, uh, we're going to need to monitor for years to come. So I, I appreciate that you brought this up, but this is just such an unknown for the entire health system. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you so much, Mr. Trone. Um, that completes our first round of questions. I'm going to proceed through the, the same order. Um, if you don't have the question, feel free to pass. But um, I have one, and then I'll move on uh, to Mr. Rutherford and on down the line. Um, Dr. Stone, uh, I, I know you know the struggles that uh, VA went through and continues to seem to be dealing with when it comes to your PPE supply. Uh, at our last hearing on VA's COVID-19 response, we discussed really serious concerns with VA needing to ration personal protective equipment um, like face masks. At the time, we were told the VA had started to improve upon your earlier policies and were now providing one mask for every VHA facility employee with N95s really being allocated to, quote, those on the front lines. But questions really are still remaining about who is considered on the front lines, given that every worker in a facility is potentially at risk when a COVID positive patient walks through the door. And there are also questions about whether employees feel comfortable with the current protections in place. VA's latest guidance issued February 7th says that VHA, quote, remains in CDC contingency strategy 
for medical gloves and N95 respirators for facilities should continue to protect staff and conserve all PPE. I'd like to know what this means in practice, particularly for N95 and surgical mask usage, where a lot of questions have been raised. And specifically, what I want to know is what type of employee receives what type of mask or respirator, and how often are they able to replace the mask? Are masks, N95s, and other supplies being disinfected and reused? Are they being changed between patients? Are employees expected to disinfect their own mask or respirator and reuse it? Or is there a centralized process? And how is the determination made of which employees receive N95 masks versus surgical or non-medical face coverings? The use of N95 is, uh, is limited to those people in direct contact with patients. Uh, and in direct contact with patients specifically that have been diagnosed with COVID, or in those uh, procedures that uh, create aerosolization, like uh, sitting at the head of the bed with an anesthesia provider. Uh, so those uh, employees are given a mask at the beginning of their shift. They can be changed out if they are contaminated or if they think that they are soiled or compromised in any way. Uh, they can be changed out. As of today, we have more than 180 day supply of N95. In fact, all PPE, we exceed 180 day supply with the exception of gloves, where uh, nitrile gloves are at about 103 day supply uh, ac across the system. Uh, and as you know, there's a worldwide shortage of nitrile uh, resulting in uh, some contingency approach to the utilization of, uh, of gloves in non-medical procedures. Probably the best example of how are we doing with this is that the Journal of uh, Epidemiology uh, released in January a study showing that 11% of American healthcare workers were infected with COVID over this last, uh, over the pandemic. Uh, the CDC last week released data showing that that number was 10.6% for American healthcare workers. For VA, it is at 4.86%. I think that's a reflection of the work that we've done in alignment with CDC to try to keep our employees safe. Okay, um, despite what might be looked at as improvements in your supply stockpiles, I'm still hearing reports of employees who are not receiving an adequate supply of PPE or being denied higher levels of protective gear despite still interacting with patients. So how is your guidance communicated to workers in the field? And what system do you, does VA have in place to receive and address concerns from workers who feel they're not receiving adequate protection? Uh, these are all uh, taken through the directives through the chief medical officer and the chief nursing officer uh, for, uh, for employees and for the guidance. All of it is checked by our epidemiologists and our infectious disease consultants to make sure it aligns to CDC guidance. And uh, anybody that feels that they are, are not uh, adequately protected, it can be brought back through their chain of command. Uh, and uh, when I say that, they can go back through their managerial leadership uh, or their chief medical officer within their institution to, uh, to uh, uh, actually challenge how this has been done. Dr. Matthews may have additional detail. Yeah, uh, I would definitely be interested, ma'am, if, if there are concerns, particularly at a facility or, or a particular service line that we look into that. We take this extremely seriously. Again, uh, with our low rates of infection of employees, I would definitely like to address that if you could pass on any further details. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be happy to. And just um, let me wrap up my line of questioning by um, just asking you about your definition of days on hand um, as a metric of supply levels. What's the target? H how many days is a comfortable supply what threshold will at what threshold will VA no longer be able to use CDC contingency levels? Um, I, I really want to understand better what the metric days on hand calculates. Is that one mask per day, one per patient? How does this work? 
Yeah, the uh, I, we'd be happy to get the people that actually calculate this out on the utilization rates of materials. It's done on a rolling three-day average of what we're consuming uh, per day. Uh, informs our days on hand, uh, and and tries and it therefore it varies each day uh, based on how busy we are or not busy we are. And uh, we'd be happy to provide you all of that data and how it's calculated. Uh, the the broad guidance I gave a year ago. Uh, Madam Chair, is is let's try to get to six months on hand uh, so that an unstable worldwide supply chain uh, cannot endanger us, nor did we want to be a further burden to the uh, national strategic stockpile like occurred uh, a year ago. And uh, so that's what we've been trying to get to. That's why we've also been growing our regional readiness centers uh, to try to make sure that we are a self-sustaining organization uh, that uh, does not uh, trample just because of our sheer size uh, on uh, a local healthcare system that is looking for supplies. Thank you very much. I know there were struggles a year ago and uh, <laughs> you often had to engage in creative measures to get access to PPE only to have your PPE that you ordered on the private market and secured uh, taken away from you. So hopefully we've, uh, we've gotten that stabilized. I uh, appreciate my colleagues' indulgence, and Mr. Rutherford, you're recognized for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Stone, in, <clears throat> in 2020, while VA was responding to uh, the outbreak of COVID and sometime after that, in that, in the discussion about VA's response, Secretary Wilkie at that time and yourself and and, and actually, even Dr. Matthews today talked about uh, recognizing the unprecedented telemedicine uh, outreach that had been that had been conducted, uh, and and the great impact that that has had. And so, in his uh, confirmation hearing, Secretary Donahue uh, said that he would not deviate. <clears throat> from Congress's intent on the Mission Act to allow veterans to continue to access care in, in their communities, uh, but that it may need to get right-sized. And, and as you're aware, that, that community care provides a relief valve for VA hospitals where, where we were getting so overwhelmed with that you, you remember all the stories about uh, wait lists and delays and, and, and all of that scandal. Uh, I, I'm concerned, would, would, would you be able to provide to us, I, I'd like to see a baseline of how many community case referrals were provided in the last few months, say October, November, December of 2020. What was the baseline of community uh, care referrals uh, to to uh, for, for our veterans during during this pandemic, so that we can then track how how it may or may not change going forward from here. Because I, I'm I, I want to make sure that we're continuing to utilize uh, the Mission Act in, in the way it was intended. Uh, can you get that information? Yeah, let me respond by saying that prior to the start of the pandemic, we were running about 499,000 referrals to the community uh, each month. Uh, the first uh, quarter of this fiscal year, October, November, December, even extending into January, we've been running 477,000 referrals into the community. Uh, because of that, um, it, it appears uh, that that drop is almost solely because of veterans uh, not feeling safe going to get their health care. Uh, it is not because we're not referring. Uh, it is simply because of delayed and deferred care. Uh, but those are the numbers that we're dealing with uh, both today and uh, and prior to the pandemic. So, so you believe there was more delay of care demand by veterans in January than there was in, say, November? Uh, yeah, it, the there is many Americans that are still uncomfortable even leaving their homes. Uh, in fact, we just went over with VBA 
uh, about some of their comp and pen exams. They have over 50,000 veterans that just are not comfortable uh, coming in to get an examination uh, for their comp and pen exam. And so uh, we're working our way through trying to make sure people feel comfortable to come in. But this is one of our big concerns under the uh, American Rescue Plan is that there is a tale here that's very similar to what occurred 100 years ago in the, in the great influenza where people put off care. And yeah. then uh, we saw more advanced uh, health care problems as we began to bring people in. Well, it, are we are, are you tracking that so that you could give us uh, a, a rolling number on that possibly? Because I, I, I think that's going to be an important number to watch for two reasons. Number one, it, it'll it'll give us an idea of how well VA continues to access the Mission Act, but it'll also uh, could highlight for you and bring to light th that fear that you're talking about, that these individuals, you know, it could become a pandemic that they don't want to come uh, for that for that service. So uh, I, I think it'd be interesting to follow that on a, on a, on a rolling scale. And if you can make that available to us, I, I think that'd be something that we could, uh, you know, you could use and we could use. Yeah, Congressman, we are following it monthly. The other okay. thing, let me add to this uh, that you haven't asked about yet. We're seeing more complex care being delivered in the community okay. for each of those referrals. And uh, these are what we call standard episodes of care. Uh, they have become much more complex in the last year than they were a year ago. And therefore, the cost has escalated. Man. Okay. I, I see my time's expired. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Stone. And I look forward to following that issue because I think it's going to be very important for our veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Uh, Mr. Chase, you're recognized for five minutes for your question. Mr. Case, did you hear me? You're recognized for five minutes for your question. Sorry, I thought you were going somewhere else. Um, Dr. Stone, if I could just kind of go back to my prior uh, questions having to do with um, state veterans home re reporting requirements uh, back to the VA and, and any follow-up action. I think I'm clear now that there is in fact a reporting requirement, a, an affirmative reporting requirement as, a, as opposed to just uh, depending on the um, depending on the cooperation between uh, the VA and the states through through the governors. Is that is that consistent with your understanding? Uh, Congressman, it is. Okay. Are you, uh, do you know whether you're actually, that's a pretty new uh, requirement. Are, do you know whether you're actually getting those reports now or is there still kind of a, some kind of a logistical or pipeline challenge in terms of of the reports uh, coming through? Are, are, and, and I guess related to that, as you get them, are there, um, if you know yet, are there any um, disturbing trends there that we should actually be focusing on much more uh, from, from the perspective of, of this subcommittee and Congress overall? Congressman, uh, I'm going to say to you that I was informed that we are up, we are running with the report, that the reports have been, been uh, posted. But I'm going to tell you, I have not been on that website to look at it. Um, when the geriatric team, which uh, really oversees this, talked to me, most of our discussion was on uh, reinstituting uh, many of the inspections that we had stood down over the last year. You know, we usually do 10 to 20 inspections a month. We had stood down many of those to reduce risk in the institutions. Uh, and since we were in so many of the institutions with our infection control teams, um, and so we're beginning to stabilize that process and get those inspections done. And that, frankly, has just begun again in the last month. Uh, but I think a robust dialogue of our relationship to the state veterans homes needs to occur. And uh, there are some states doing this very, very well. And there are some states that have reached out to us asking us for help redefining the relationship between their senior health leadership and those that are running their systems. Okay, uh, well, much appreciated. And I certainly would um, uh, like to contribute uh, where, where we can to, to getting that straight because I don't wanna see another kutsu um, occur, you know, anywhere in my state or for that matter, the rest of the, rest of the, uh, the country. 
Um, and I think that um, that was my next uh, question, which was, are you, are you, are you, are you actually, uh, are you actually conducting those um, at least annual inspections uh, throughout the country? And I think, if I understand you correctly, you suspended for a little while out of out of health concerns, but are now reinstating. And I think that's a, I think that's exactly the right thing to do. I think there does need to be, you know, uh, oversight uh, by by the VA in addition to simple simple reporting along the way. So I would encourage that. And if there's something we need to do to help you on that, um, happy to happy to contribute to that. Um, just quickly, um, back to back to vaccinations and uh, delivery to underserved rural areas of our country. Um, you've touched about on it a little bit, but um, you know, where you don't have large facilities in urban areas, and you know, my state is a perfect example where we have large parts of the uh, the state that are on different islands that are that are quite underserved from a from a healthcare perspective. It's tough. It's tough to get the, the vaccines out to uh, vets in, in those areas, and for that matter, if you start talking about the rest of the Pacific Islands, <clears throat> similar issue. Uh, what special focus on 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 equality, I, or at least parity? I would I guess I would say as to distribution to rural versus urban. Yeah, I, I think the rural versus urban is a little different than the question I was anticipating from you, and that was uh, the the question on how are we doing with with uh, communities of color. Uh, and I'm quite pleased to tell you that in communities of color, uh, we're actually exceeding what we are in the white population of America. Uh, and I'm really pleased at how uh, black and Hispanic veterans uh, are, uh, are accepting the vaccine across the nation. Where there is inequity is in uh, rural and highly rural communities. And I think uh, Dr. Matthews has some additional detail on that. Yeah. Uh we are actually the group has been pulling together some focus groups to get a better understanding of of any trends with regard to vaccine hesitancy and in rurally have some more well targeted outreach efforts to those groups but yes unfortunately our, our rural uh populations across all age groups actually um are are showing differences uh that we definitely need to address thank you dr matthews i would simply point out to you that um I don't think it's hesitancy per se. Sometimes, sometimes rural accessibility is equated to reluctance to utilize the veterans health system, and in this case, hesitancy. And I, I don't think you can make that assumption necessarily. There may be some empirical evidence for that, but I'm just talking about basic accessibility for folks that don't have any hesitancy. Uh, <laughs> I agree, sir. I'm I'm sorry for lumping those two together. Um, we are uh, tracking hesitancy and, and did want to make a point that there, there are some differences that we're seeing in those areas, but I agree it's also about accessibility as, as you're trying uh, uh, to uh, ask about. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, a, a great deal of that effort is, is definitely needing to be very locally targeted so that we can have those successes like we did in Montana and Alaska, and we'll continue uh, to, to push additional mobile deployment efforts um, in order to really target those communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Case. And uh, I, I'd also actually also be interested in knowing um, to what you attribute your ability to reach a higher percentage of minority populations, um, because it's obviously that's been a struggle in the more general population. So it would be great if you could follow up with, uh, follow up with us on that as well. Mr. Gonzalez, you're, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I would like to uh, go back to discussing uh, telemedicine. So I'm a proponent of telemedicine. I'm an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran. A lot of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, I think, have hopped on board with the telemedicine kind of theme. Uh, if one takeaway from this pandemic has been um, that that role in telemedicine has grown more acceptable, but there's a, there's also a lot of uh, older generation that still haven't fully uh, uh, gotten access to that. So the question for for the for uh, for Dr. Stone and Dr. Matthews is what do you need from this subcommittee to further telemedicine? I think that you've given us um, extraordinary resources. 
But one of the things that we've begun to recognize, especially as we've attempted to uh, distribute uh, things like uh, cellular enabled iPads, uh, to, and we've, we, we've given almost 100,000 of those out over the pandemic to help uh, reach people in, in tough, challenged areas, is that the country may be moving beyond um, infrastructure of um, a wired system to a wireless uh, system. And I think uh, providing some discussion and dialogue regarding where are we going with cellular enabled devices rather than, than wired or, or, uh, or Wi-Fi enabled devices is, is one of the things we've worked towards, especially in highly rural areas and in Native American uh, uh, enclaves uh, where we've, uh, we've seen just tough ability to get anybody to help us build an infrastructure around them. So it's really about infrastructure that I think we struggled with. The other thing we've recognized is that although there's been tremendous acceptance of telemedicine, uh, it is video type visits like you and I are doing right now that is uh, really something that veterans want to stay with and are satisfied with. They are giving up telephone based visits pretty rapidly to come back to some sort of human interaction that allows some some face to face work where uh, you get to know my facial expressions and I get to know yours. It, and uh, there's tremendous satisfaction and uh, veterans are saying to us they want to stay with what we call a VA Video Connect. And therefore expansion of VA Video Connect under the American Rescue Plan is something that we would like to continue dialogue on and, uh, and continue to expand, especially in a cellular enabled system. And Dr. Matthews, I don't know if you want to add anything more to that. No, I'm glad you pointed out the the, the cellular access. I, I think as much as we can provide services, we can provide them with the, the actual tools. Um, sometimes uh, the accessibility, just how they connect to the system is a larger problem um, that that I think it'll, it, it definitely will take more than VA alone to, to address, unfortunately. Great, thank you for that response. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Trohn, uh, you're recognized for five minutes of time. Okay, I just got one quick question. Um, your mitigation strategy that you put in to protect the vets and protect the employees in your inpatient nursing homes, assisted living areas, um, led, of course, to a lot of visitor restrictions and, you know, contributed to isolation and some of the problems that we talked about before. Uh, what have we done, Dr. Matthews, to help mitigate these issues and strategies and how they affect our veterans and um, help our residents cope with this yeah. new reality? Now, uh, another great question, sir. This is um, an area that uh, we've been really trying to promote a lot of best practices that we've seen across the country. Um, you know, you've, you've heard of the plenty of stories of, of communication through the glass, through plastic wrap and the like, and we're really uh, trying to promote that our local leadership make those different modalities available. Um, first and foremost, of course, safety concerns are, are necessary. So we've also increased a lot of our surveillance testing um, of both uh, the actual residents of either inpatient or home, as well as the staff, so that we can assure that, that, that safety is preserved. But those connections with family members, whether, again, it's through those iPads uh, that we've increased distribution of, uh, to individual veterans as well as on our floors. Um, we're really trying to assure that there's connection, whether it's electronically or, or through a glass pane, um, but that's being promoted through multiple best practices around the country. That's great, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Trone. Um, thank you to all the members who uh, really asked insightful questions. This hearing really was tremendously helpful in getting updates and we look forward to getting the uh, information that you're, you'll come back to us for the record. Um, Mr. Rutherford, do you have any closing comments before we wrap up? Uh, I, I just wanna thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I've said before, I think this is one of the most productive committees I've sat on uh, since I've been in Congress. And the questions that these members bring up 
are always uh, spot on. So th thank you to you and, and thank you to the members for making this uh, really a productive meeting. And thank you, Dr. Stone and Dr. Matthews uh, for providing the, the, the information that we need to be able to talk to our constituents uh, in, in, a, uh, in an enlightened way. So thank, thank you both very much and thank you for all you're doing. Thank you so much, Mr. Rutherford. I appreciate the kind words and we'll continue to work together uh, in a bipartisan way to really just help make sure we can serve our nation's veterans and our active duty military. It's really an honor. Uh, it's what's incredibly special about being a member of this important committee. Um, that concludes this afternoon's hearing. Appreciate everyone uh, participating and, uh, and spending the nearly two hours that it took us to get through some of these critical questions. Um, I look forward to continuing this important dialogue because you know, we know that we have a maybe pinhole of light in at the end of the tunnel on, on the pandemic, but we've got a ways to go. So making sure that we can continue to help our veterans and their and the employees of the VA get through this is going to be a, a critical component of our responsibility. I want to remind members that our next virtual hearing is on Wednesday, February 24th. That's next week, 2021. And that hearing will be on remediation and impact of PFAS on service members. With that, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you so much.